Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today for Get to Know the Scientists. Uh, we're here to talk about everything from what inspired scientists to become scientists to what they are doing today at the NOAA National Severe Storms Laboratory and CERO. We are really excited you joined us. My name is Vanna Malevsky. I study lightning here at the lab and I will be moderating and taking your questions for our panelists today. We will be starting with an introductory video to let you know a little bit about the history of NSSL and then also to introduce each one of our panelists and what they do and how they ended up where they are today. So we'll start that off in just a minute and then after that we'll go into the live section. Welcome to the weather festival here uh, in Norman, Oklahoma. Um, I've been chosen to give some history about the laboratory. And the reason is I was a graduate student here at the University of Oklahoma in 1963 when NSSL, National Severe Storms Laboratory, came to Norman. It's a privilege to work here and it's a privilege also to give you the history of how it came into existence. In the late 50s, there were several severe airplane accidents caused by lightning. Especially in 1959, there was a Viscount small plane flying over Maryland and lightning struck the fuel tanks on that plane set it ablaze and it crashed, kill, killing all 31 people. After that event and a couple of other events with airplanes and lightning, it was decided in 1959, 1960 to start a special project for the U.S. Weather Bureau. It was called the National Severe Storms Project and it started in Kansas City, Missouri, and part of that project was called Rough Rider. And in that project, they flew a jet airplane into storms and basically were trying to measure lightning activity and relate it to radar measurements from the surface. And that exercise convinced a lot of people in Washington, D.C., in the U.S. Weather Bureau to start the, new, the U.S. National Severe Storms Laboratory. So in 1963, the laboratory came to Norman with a radar in Norman, WSR-57, not a Doppler radar, but a good radar that could measure precipitation out to about 50 miles and tell you at least the structure of storms. But in the early 60s, the first director was Edwin Kessler. And he was an expert in precipitation systems. And he came to Norman and actually was one of the participants in Project Rough Rider. But I would say his overall theme as director from 1963 to 1986, almost 25 years, was development of weather radar, and especially a certain kind of radar called Doppler radar. Hi, my name is Rachel Miller, and I'm a PhD student at the University of Oklahoma. I study lines of thunderstorms, specifically ones that happen at night. I'm from Sykesville, Maryland, which, for those of you who have never heard of it, is a small town of about 4,000 people just outside of Baltimore. Now, unlike a lot of other people in meteorology, I didn't have a specific tornado or hurricane that inspired me to go into weather. Um, in Maryland, we mostly get just some thunderstorms in the afternoon during the summer. Nothing too exciting. But I have always enjoyed science, and I was always reading books about science. In fact, when I was in second grade, my grandmother got me a weather book. And according to my mom, I read that book from cover to cover so many times that I basically had the book memorized. I still found weather interesting as I got older, um, but I didn't really think about it as a career path until I was in high school. I was working on a project for a class when we had to research different careers we might be interested in. 
And that's when I realized that meteorology was a major in college. So at that point, I decided I was going to study meteorology and focused on schools that had a really good program for that. And that's what led me to the University of Oklahoma. Now, when I got to know you, I still didn't know what exactly I wanted to do with weather. You can go into forecasting, into research, you can work for a company. There's multiple different things to go into. It wasn't until I was able to work on uh, a field project when I was an undergrad that I really realized that research is what I wanted to go into. So this project specifically focused on lightning, which means I got to help launch these large instruments into thunderstorms that pop up in central Florida. In fact, we need a 26 foot U-Haul truck in order to fill up these balloons in order to lift up these instruments because they were much heavier than the normal instruments we launch into the atmosphere. Seeing the data we collected from that and to think about how scientists would use that data really inspired me to go into research. In fact, my current project that I'm working on uses data that I helped collect on another field project. So I would say my favorite thing about what I do in meteorology is that I get to help collect and go out into the field to get the data that I get to use on my projects. My name is Dr. Sean Waugh and I'm a research scientist at NOAA's National Severe Storms Laboratory, which is located in the National Weather Center in Norman, Oklahoma. And as a research scientist, I am tasked with understanding the world around us, trying to understand what makes severe weather tick. Why do we have hail and hurricanes and lightning and tornadoes, those sorts of things. And to try to understand that, we need to take observations. And what I do at my job is actually design and build and operate a lot of that research equipment that we use to go out and collect that data. So it's a lot of hands-on work and it's a very challenging type of work because you know we're trying to push the envelopes of things that we haven't even studied yet and that's really exciting to me. And that drive and that passion for meteorology has been something that I've had my entire life. My earliest memory that I can remember is back on my grandfather's farm actually in north central Kansas and he was a farmer so he had a lot of crops in the area and there was a severe storm coming through and he was watching the news and he was very concerned because the weatherman on TV kept talking about hail and lightning and you know that was a threat to his crops and it ended up not happening which is good but he was upset with the weatherman and you know complaining that they're always wrong and they get paid to be wrong all the time and I kind of stood up and I was like grandpa I'm gonna grow up someday and you know I'm gonna be a weatherman and I'm gonna be right all the time and he said well you're gonna make a lot of money and everybody's gonna watch you because you're gonna be the only one and that just stuck with me and, and I followed that passion all the way through grade school and middle school and high school you know I never really deviated off of wanting to become a meteorologist and I followed that all the way to the University of Oklahoma which is where I studied and actually got several degrees in meteorology all the way up through my PhD but when I came to OU I had a very narrow picture of what meteorology was I knew about you know the National Weather Service forecasters and the, and the people that you see on TV but I didn't really know anything about the research world and, and how expansive it actually is so coming to OU allowed me to explore that side of things and really find out what my interests are and what my skill sets were and how I can apply those to contribute to the field of meteorology which is what landed me where I am today and I think that's why I love my job so much is that using those skills and trying to solve problems that we don't have answers to there's no set path there's no right or wrong answer there's no you know if you do these four steps you'll solve your problem we don't know half the time we don't even know what the question is that we need to be asking so we go out and we try to observe the events around us and the weather that we all experience as humans and try to understand how it works and that challenge to me is very interesting and it's very intriguing and my education and my skills that I've developed over the years kind of help push me into that direction and, and that's something that I really really love about the position that I'm in and the work that I get to do. Hello my name is Dustin Sharp I'm a Cooperative Institute scientist working for the NOAA National Severe Storms Laboratory. I specialise in social science, which is the aspect of science that deals with society and the impacts of severe weather on society. Today I'm going to talk to you about my journey to the lab uh, in Norman, Oklahoma, um, although today I'm recording this from uh, my garden here in London. Um, I became a geographer at the age of 10, which is a very strange thing to, to say or even want perhaps, 
But what happened was I went to the Far East with my parents on a foreign holiday. It's the only foreign holiday we had. But it really opened my eyes to the world because I saw children who were less well off than I, but I also saw amazing cultures and amazing uh, religious buildings and countryside. And that really made me fascinated with the world. And I think I became a geographer at that age. Um, as I went through my studies, I uh, studied an undergraduate degree in environmental science. And when I'd finished university, I ended up working as a web designer which was quite interesting but the things that really interested me was the teaching of web design which I was doing at night and I then eventually retrained as a teacher of geography. While as a teacher of geography we bought a seismograph and it recorded the tsunami and earthquake that occurred in 2004 in the Indian Ocean that killed uh, hundreds of thousands of people. I thought this was very unfair and I wanted to know how I could help to prevent such disasters from happening in future. And it was then that I decided to undertake a PhD at King's College London, specialising in disaster risk reduction. When I'd finished that in 2018, I then worked for the United Nations Disaster Agency on policy. And I, at the same time, I was working as a lecturer. And although these were both very, very interesting, they weren't really to my mind helping me to help others and that's where the job at the lab really came in because this is all about um, societal impacts of severe weather and so what I do now is I go and ask people what they feel that they can and can't do what sheltering uh, options they have or don't have and if we can improve those and if not what are the alternatives to that end, I've also been developing a web-based survey which will allow people to record when tornadoes occur near them to say what they did, what they felt that they could do and couldn't do, uh, what they did under the tornado watch and what they did under the tornado warning. And it's these sorts of questions and hopefully the answers that we get back from the public that helps us as scientists better improve our communication, messaging and warning for our populations that we serve and this is really at the root of what I do and if you've got any questions about that I'm happy to answer those today. So to that end, I, that's me, I hope that's uh, given you a sort of an introduction into, uh, into what I've been doing and I look forward to answering your questions as part of the National Weather Festival. Thank you very much. My name is Kenzie Grojak, and I am a research scientist at the OU Center for Risk and Crisis Management, as well as a cooperative institute at OU and the Storm Prediction Center. And luckily, I have the opportunity to collaborate with scientists at the National Severe Storms Laboratory quite often. My research focuses on severe weather information and how people make decisions using that information. So this means that we do things like interview emergency managers or forecasters to try to understand their jobs and how we might be able to develop new methods or techniques to communicate information more effectively. We also conduct surveys of people from all over the country to see how they use severe weather information. Sometimes we find out, for example, that there might be a gap in the information flow that really could be effective to fill with, say, the timing of severe weather information or what hazards are most likely to occur. So we use that knowledge to try to develop new products or techniques to help fill that information gap. I'm originally from a suburb of Minneapolis, Minnesota, and there really wasn't one specific time when I remember all of a sudden wanting to go into weather research. When I was in high school, I actually really wanted to be a teacher. I went to Iowa State University and ended up taking a few meteorology classes and decided that this was pretty cool and maybe I wanted to try it as a major. Um, I actually ended up enjoying those classes so much that I did end up getting my bachelor's degree, uh, where during that time I was able to have an internship that really opened my eyes to research meteorology. I got to spend a summer in Norman, Oklahoma, working with scientists at the National Severe Storms Laboratory. And this summer really got me interested in graduate school and made me realize that there were other careers in meteorology 
besides just forecasting and broadcast meteorology. So I attended the University of Oklahoma for my master's and PhD. Um, and this is when I actually got inside, excited about a specific type of research, the human side of meteorology. So throughout this journey, I thought I wanted to be a teacher and then maybe a forecaster and then maybe a researcher and then maybe researching the human side. So it was really a step-by-step -step process. I certainly didn't know this is what I wanted to do right away. But during my graduate school time, I realized that there's a lot of work to be done to understand how humans interact with meteorology. So for example, it's a human that makes the forecast, who then passes it on to another human to make decisions, who then passes it on probably to another human to make more decisions. I really like being able to understand all of these different perspectives and how they work together to create this really interesting flow of information. Now, this all sounds really fine and dandy, um, but I think it's important to remember that I didn't know that this is what I wanted to do right away. I didn't, you know, decide that I wanted to be a meteorologist when I was five. Like a lot of people have this really important storm that they remember deciding that they wanted to be a meteorologist. Um, that's not how all of us decide that we wanted to go into weather. And it's really cool if you decide right away when you're little or in the middle of high school, college, graduate school, whatever. One of my favorite things about my job is getting to work with all different kinds of people from researchers to forecasters to emergency managers. Uh, and again, getting all those different perspectives, having conversations about their jobs and what's important to them. Sometimes I even get to talk with members of the public and it's really rewarding to see all of these different perspectives and how we might serve all different kinds of people. Hi there, welcome to the Weather Fest. I'm Bob Rabin, a research meteorologist at the NOAA Severe Storms Lab. I wanted to share a little bit about my uh, path to my job here. I developed an interest in watching and trying to forecast the weather since I was really young. I grew up just north of Chicago, close to the Lake Michigan shore. And I just had this, this natural fascination of watching the changes in the weather, different extreme weather that we had in that area anything from blizzards to sea breezes to tornadoes, hailstorms, droughts. And back when I was that age, um, we didn't have uh, the tools that we, we have now. Uh, we didn't have smartphones that we could look at and get continuous updates. It took a little bit more patience to uh, get information. And I think that added to the mystery of the weather, not knowing exactly what was going to happen and giving it time to try to forecast it uh, without having a lot of external information to look at. As I grew older, I started to seek out a path to becoming uh, a meteorologist and found out that I had to go to college and get a degree. I ended up going to a smaller college, Northeastern Illinois University in Chicago. And it was probably the best choice I made because the classes were very small. I got a lot of individual attention. Didn't offer a degree in meteorology though, but I took some of the basic science and math classes and then transferred to a larger university, actually in Canada, uh, McGill University in Montreal, and got my uh, degrees there. And during that time, I had the opportunity to come to Norman to do an internship. And that was probably one of the best choices I made in terms of being able to really see what are the different opportunities uh, in the field of meteorology. And then I went back and completed my degrees and eventually I got a job here. And the first few years were exciting uh, in that I was using Doppler radar measurements to observe wind patterns before thunderstorms form. Most research was being done on the storms themselves. And the idea of using those winds was to improve forecasting of exactly where and when the storms would form, sometimes before clouds actually appeared. Later, I had the opportunity to uh, work with a NOAA group in Madison, Wisconsin at the University of Wisconsin on weather satellites. And that was a, a, another exciting time for me. 
learning about how the satellites made the observations and then using them for some new type of measurements. We looked at how thunderstorms developed from looking at the tops and whether there's information to gauge severity in addition to radar data. Also looked at effects of mankind on changing the weather or changing climate uh, using satellite measurements, particularly um, land use where crops are grown in large areas and found that indeed there are effects um, due to these large areas of agriculture on temperature and cloud cover. So I hope you find your passion, whatever it is, and you're able to pursue it. And I hope you enjoy the rest of the Weather Fest. Thank you. So we do have some questions which have already been submitted. We will be starting with those. Uh, but it's not too late for you to submit more questions. On the sidebar of the GoToWebinar control panel, you should see a little, a little thing that says questions. At any point during the meeting, please feel free to submit questions over there and we will try to get to them and give our panelists a chance to answer them. Uh, we'll collect these questions throughout the meeting and we'll answer as many as we possibly can. Uh, you can enter a question for all of our panelists or for a couple of them here specifically. Uh, hopefully we can get to all of them, but if we don't, or you want to find out more information, or you discover you still have more questions for our scientists after this panel is over, you can always send an email to nssl.outreach at noaa.gov. That is nssl.outreach at noaa, spelled N-O-A-A, dot gov. And we're always happy to answer questions, and they will make sure that it gets to the right people to answer those questions. So our first question that we have up today is, what is your favorite type of weather? So Justin, will you start us off? Yes, I will. Um, hello and welcome everybody. Um, my favorite weather is uh, autumn, uh, but that's what we call it in England. You will call it fall. And I like it because you have lovely crisp early mornings where you can go for a run. The light is really beautiful, um, but then it warms up a little bit in the, in the day, but it's not too hot. So that's my favorite weather. Um, so my favorite weather is probably nighttime thunderstorms, uh, not severe ones, uh, just some nice, gentle rolling thunder in the background and some light rain to help you fall asleep. I think I'm probably next. Um, so I think my favorite weather is actually those overcast cloudy days um, where there's actually not too much sun. I find that to just be really cozy and coming from Minnesota, that's the type of weather that really reminds me of home. So I'll be the odd one out and say that my uh, interests more lie in the severe weather side of things. I grew up with thunderstorms in Kansas. So, you know, when you have those loud crashes of thunder and the heavy driving rain and, you know, even some hail, I, I really enjoy those types of events. It takes a turn when it starts damaging things or when it damages things of, you know, friends and family and things like that. But I, I enjoy the more severe weather aspect of things. Thank you all. Uh, let's see. Our next question. Um, does geographical area impact lightning strikes or have an impact on how often the lightning strikes? So does the region impact lightning? Um, does any one of our panelists specifically want to start us off on that one? If not, I'm going to nominate Sean. I was going to say, I can take a stab at that one. Uh, I think the region does, we do see variations in lightning activity in different regions. A lot of people are very aware that Florida has a high number of lightning strikes, for example. They get a lot of afternoon thunderstorms. Oklahoma has had a recent occurrence of a tremendous amount of lightning in some of the storm systems that we've had. So it can change, and it changes depending on not only geographical location, but also time of year, depending on when your storm season is that you know, most active. There are also regions that don't have as many thunderstorms, so they tend to not have as much lightning. I have a friend that I grew up with that moved out to Seattle, actually, in, in the Pacific Northwest. And he was like, it's very weird now whenever I hear thunder because it's not something that we have a lot of. You know, we see rain all the time, but we don't really get that that lightning and that thunder aspect of things. So it does change uh, depending on where you are.
Awesome. Thank you, Sean. Um, and we do have a follow on question that follows along really well. Uh, can you change the path of lightning and does a camera flash make a path for lightning? I'll, uh, I'll take a stab at that and anybody else can jump in if they want. Um, so there are things that can affect the path of lightning and a good example of that, uh, some of the research studies that we've actually been involved with in the past, and I, you know, Rachel has been involved in these types of projects before, have actually involved the use of triggered lightning where they launch a rocket that has a wire attached to the end of it and they launch this into active thunderstorms and the idea is to try to intentionally trigger lightning to follow the wire lead down so they can measure optical properties or electrical properties and the power that's associated with those lightning strikes. So there are things that we can do to kind of control that. Uh, lightning has kind of a will of its own when you allow it to and, and you know you can put up towers and metal things to try to attract it to try to do things to help induce a lightning strike or to prevent one. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Um, I don't think I've ever heard of a camera flash attracting lightning. Uh, I know that there are some cameras that you can actually get attachments for, though, that will initiate the uh, the shot that you're trying to take based off of the pre-flash part of the lightning. So you actually capture lightning a little bit more readily so you don't have to sit there and just, you know, repeatedly press the button a whole bunch of times. Uh, so there, there are some things that we can do to, to modify that lightning path. But for the most part, it kind of goes where it wants to. Thank you, Sean, as lightning scientists, but also the moderator. You know, I don't really have anything to add, so appreciate it. Um, one of our other questions that was submitted ahead of time by Noah, uh, what percentage of scientists at NSSL have graduate degrees? How many have just a master's? And how, many, how often do you get to work together with the National Weather Service, Norman, and the SBC? So I'll go ahead and answer the first one because I have the numbers in front of me. Uh, so in the NSSL side specifically, 68% uh, of our scientists have PhDs, 21% have masters and 11% just have a bachelor's. On the CERO side, so the University of Oklahoma side, um, just the numbers here locally, 9% uh, have a bachelor's, 44 have a master's and 46 have a PhD. Uh, so that's the general default. I, I don't know if the panelists have anything they wanted to add to that. Uh, Rachel is on this panel and is still pursuing her PhD, uh, so I don't know if there's something you'd like to say about that one. Kind of put me on the spot. Uh, what was the second question about people? Um, so do people work together a lot, I guess? Um, oh, yes. The second question, how often do you get to work with the National Weather Service and the SPC? Gotcha. Um, so I actually, uh, going to OU for undergrad, I got a chance to do a uh, four-credit internship um, with the SPC. Uh, so there are opportunities for both undergraduate and graduate students um, to work with the SPC. And that was a really cool experience and kind of a intro to research. And I'll just say that um, I work with SPC quite a bit. And so being as we're all in the same building, those opportunities do exist. And it's um, a really cool place to get to, you know, physically when we are in the building, most of the time, uh, actually get to go and walk between floors and go see people in different organizations. So those collaborations definitely do happen pretty frequently. I might add a little bit, uh, which is, it's it's one thing to look at the number of degrees that are present here in the building, but it's also really interesting to start looking at the types of degrees. A lot of people, I think, come in and expect everybody to be a meteorologist, and we have meteorologists, and we have engineers, and we have social scientists, we have um, you know people that study like city planning and, and emergency management and things like that, and all of these aspects of things are are very critical and very important to the work that we do because it's not enough to just understand the meteorology, it's how do we apply that? How do we you know, take that information and make it more available to the public so that they can understand it and things like that. So it's really neat seeing how different people from different backgrounds can work together and use their individual areas of expertise and then kind of piece all that together to make things make a little bit more sense and be a little bit more useful. You know, I just wanted to add that um, one of the projects I'm working on at the moment is working with um, National Weather Service offices uh, on the sheltering issue because they know their sheltering needs and where there are shelters way better than I do. Um, and I've got a mapping project going at the moment and we're reaching out to them so that they can talk with the, their emergency managers to confirm whether there are shelters and when they're going to be open because we're trying to get that information out to the public so the public 
understand where their shelters are and when they can go to them and when they're not going to be open as well. So, you know, we, we do uh, communicate in that way as well. Thank you, everyone. I want to officially welcome Bob Rabin onto the panel. Glad you you joined us. Uh, our next question that's been submitted is what degrees or degree or degrees do each of you have? And Bob, let's start off, start off with you. All right, it seems you're still muted. Hold on a minute. Excellent. Hear me okay? <laughs> so I have a I have a, a bachelor's and a master's uh, degree in meteorology from McGill University in Canada, and then I got a it's actually technically called a doctor d'état degree in France at uh, in Paris, um, equivalent to to a doctorate, but I took a very different route than most people, uh, getting the international experience there. Thank you. Kenzie? Sorry, I forgot what order we were going in. Um, so my, I have three degrees in meteorology. I got my bachelor's from Iowa State University um, and then my master's and PhD from the University of Oklahoma. And while those degrees are technically in meteorology, I will just say that um, by training, I'm a meteorologist, but by experience, I am more of a social scientist. And so um, it's been really interesting to get to kind of combine the two and learn different skills from both fields to try to apply them to what we like to call wicked problems in meteorology. Sean? Kenzie, I don't remember the order that we were going to go into any of these questions. Uh, I have three degrees in meteorology, a bachelor's, a master's, and a PhD. I got all of them from the University of Oklahoma, so I have not moved very far. Uh, but like Kenzie, my degrees may be in meteorology, but practically most of my experience is probably closer to the engineering side of things and using that meteorology knowledge in sort of a, a different way. Justin, you're up next. Hi, yes, yeah, so um, my bachelor's was Bachelor of Science in Environmental Studies. Um, I then um, trained as a teacher, so you have to do something called a postgraduate certificate in education, which I did at the Institute of Education in London. And I have a PhD in Geography uh, from King's College London, where I specialised in uh, disaster risk reduction. Um, and I'll finish up. So I only have two degrees. Um, I have both my bachelor's and my master's um, from OU in meteorology. Um, and I am currently working on my PhD. So I have about a year or so left uh, until I get that. All right. So our next question, um, are there any internships within NSSL? If so, how would you apply? Uh, a couple of follow-on questions with that. So um, does this include non-traditional students and are there any other ways to learn about the internships? And I will go ahead and call out Justin for this one to start us off. And as you can see from my shocked face, uh, I think my answer is I'm actually unsure. So I'm sure there are, and I'm sure there are other people here who've had maybe experience of that. Um, I know there are certain programs that are run here for, for, for undergraduates. Um, the REU, uh, can anyone help me out with the what that actually the acronym of that means? Let's jump research, in. It's a research experience for undergraduates. Perfect. Thank you very much. So I know and I've met some of the people through that. So there is some opportunities and I imagine that um, they're, they're there within the lab as well. And um, as a social scientist, we're always looking for people who might be interested as well to come and uh, join us maybe through these things. So that's all I'm going to say on that one. Someone else chime in. You might have a better answer. 
I'll just say that there are quite a few different opportunities. And yeah, there is definitely opportunities for non-traditional students as well. Justin mentioned the REU program. Um, that's a good one to apply to as an undergraduate. There's also the NOAA Hollings program. Um, that one's directly through NOAA, and you can go to um, the summer internship at any of the labs or the National Weather Service offices, et cetera. So there's certainly a number of different things to get involved with over the summer and also during the um, academic year too if uh, you have an opportunity at your own institution to get to shadow your professor or um, shadow a meteorologist at the National Weather Service that's also a really good option um, if you wanted to do something during the academic year too. All right, and we have one other that I didn't hear mentioned. It's the, the Bill LaPenta student internship as well. I will put the link for that in the chat. So if that's something of interest to you, that one will be there as well. Um, I think there was a follow on on that one. Is there a way to stand out when applying for internships that you would recommend? I hear, th I see thinking faces. Go ahead, Justin. I, I was going to say the best way to stand out is to be yourself. I think that if you're really passionate about a subject and you really want to learn about it, that will come across in your application. I think it always does. Um, don't try and be something that you're not. Be honest, uh, be true to yourself. Um, and I think that is the best way. And that will come across and then you'll, you know, maybe get to that interview stage and then, you know, they'll learn a little bit more about you. Anyone have anything they want to add to that? I think the, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, the only thing that I would add to that is it can be really challenging when doing these types of applications. And, and I remember I applied for the Hawking Scholarship and got it. And that was actually how I got started here at NSSL was through that internship. And it kind of led to the position that I'm in now. Um, don't be afraid to try it for sure, because there were several people that I know that that tried those types of programs. and you realize that maybe this isn't exactly what you were interested in, but it does give you an idea of what you are interested in. But when you're applying for those types of things, it can be really challenging because some people feel like you're you're bragging too much on yourself and you know you're trying to make yourself seem better. But I mean that's kind of the goal, right? Like don't be afraid to, you know, speak to your own strengths. I mean, you know what those strengths are and, and don't be afraid to 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 showcase those. You know, don't feel like you're like being you know too aggressive about it or, or things like that like it's it's good to have a little bit of that type of uh feeling in your your applications there and it can be really challenging to do that i was going to add actually to that because that's a perfect thing that i've thought about it is that um you'll learn so much about doing it and even if you're not successful at one particular program at one particular place that experience will help you get stronger when you do it again and again and again, because you never know, you know, where the things are going to fall out and where you end up. You know, I applied for lots of different things before I, I found out here in the job before this. I was very upset that I didn't get, you know, I got I was through to the last two candidates. They flew me from the UK over to the university. I was thinking, yeah, this is good. I'm a shoe in. Nope. I didn't get that job and it was you know it felt at the time devastating and then a few weeks later you know I, I literally found out about this job on Twitter uh, someone you know reached out to me on Twitter direct DM me and said I just I think you're good for this job and I looked at it and went yeah okay let's give that a go and and, and and I got the job and you know it's been a great decision ever since so yeah I think sometimes it's okay to fail you know or feel like you failed because you learn so much about it Thank you. Uh, reminder to everyone, it's not too late to submit more questions. It should be a questions thing. Do feel free at any point in time, if anyone's talking to add more questions to the list. Um, next question up, uh, what can a first year meteorology student like myself do to prepare for a career within NSSL? And a similar question is, are there any specific schools, degree programs, or particular degrees that make one more marketable for employment at NSSL? Um, I'm going to throw this one over to Rachel first. 
Um, so yeah, so I actually got my start um, in NSSL as an undergrad. Um, I just applied for a job that was listed through an SSL scientist. Um, and so that helped kind of get my foot in the door. Um, but in regards to that, um, I was just taking an opportunity, looking at a um, a job listing that was in, you know, involved in research and just going for it. It was enlightening, which I didn't really have uh, too much of a background in, uh, especially I believe I got the job as a sophomore. Um, but just you learn on the job and that got me sort of my research experience. Um, and then to get to NSSL as a grad student, um, luckily at OU, um, a lot of the NSSL scientists uh, do mentor grad students. Um, and so I worked under a NSSL scientist as my advisor. Um, and so that's how I got in uh, with that. So as an undergrad, really focus on any opportunities you can get uh, jobs in undergrad to do research, because uh, that'll really help set you apart. Um, and yeah, just take those opportunities uh, that your school offers for you. I'm just gonna call on people because I feel like there's enough different experiences here. Bob, do you have any suggestions? Oh, hold on, you're muted. Let me see if I can mute you on my end. Very good. <laughs> I was gonna suggest taking a close look at the NSL website at the different projects that are going on, become familiar with those and see what you think you might be really interested in or want to contribute to. That will give you a heads up into maybe what sort of areas to begin focusing on. And um, the other thing I want to point out is that uh, we're, we're, uh, we're blessed, as, as all the NOAA labs are, of having cooperative institutes uh, at the university. There's far more jobs available I think entry jobs you'll find through the Cooperative Institute, which may be working with NSSL, but even others that are working on interesting projects, not at NSSL, but dealing with atmospheric science and related science. So um, there's a broad area there you could be interested in as well. So I, I would just suggest looking at it all and you know, seeing where to go from there. raise my hand make sure I wasn't cutting anybody else off um, <clears throat> the only thing that I might add to all this and, and these are all like really great points um, you know like Rachel said like just volunteering for things and, and getting involved in research projects is a really good way to test that out so to speak to find out if it's something that you're interested in whether that be research in general or that particular type but a lot of people I think might have the mentality that you only have those opportunities if you're here at OU and OU is a fantastic school and there are lots of professors and staff members and NSSL scientists that you can work with if you're here but other universities also have a lot of opportunities so don't feel like you're locked into any one individual university you know we collaborate with a ton of people across the entire US and even internationally in some cases to work on different projects and that involves working with students from those universities as well so there are lots of opportunities out there no matter where you are you can get involved you can you know be a part of research projects and you know continue to make yourself kind of more amenable to research and, and help your career path going forward if that's something that you're interested in. And I'll just add really quickly that these are all really good points. And if there's anything else um, to maybe focus on outside of research experience, it's communication skills, whether that be written or um, speaking, like public speaking skills, which I know are really scary a lot of the time. Um, but those are really important skills to help us share our science with folks within NISL and outside. Um, so those are, that's maybe another skill that if you can put that on a CV or in a personal statement, would might be a good thing to highlight. Justin, did you have anything to add? I did not, and that's why I was quiet. <laughs> All right, fantastic. Uh, similar question uh, that we received, or at least following on, is will my computer science skills, I'm not sure if this is skills or degrees, uh, help me get into the field of meteorology? So if anyone wants to answer from that perspective of a very different, different backgrounds. 
I see nodding heads. All right, I'll jump will... okay. <laughs> That way Vanna isn't forced to like, you know, poke at somebody. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. Um, a lot of research is learning how to write code, is, is learning how to process data, is learning how to just visualize the data. You know, it's one thing to go out and design a field project, for example, to collect observations on lightning, but then being able to take those observations and actually do something with the data and display it in a way that makes sense. A lot of that is computer science skills behind the scenes. Um, just learning how to manage the data that you're working with. And I mean, in some cases, that's a relatively small amount. In some cases, that's tens, if not hundreds of terabytes of data that you've got to work with. So having computer science skills, knowing how to code and knowing how to code in different languages and how to code efficiency or efficiently, those are all really, really good skills to have and very, very useful for this field. So this might be surprising from a social scientist, but I think those skills are important there as well. Yeah, I, I used to be a web designer before I was, you know, before I did teaching and things like that. And those skills are really useful as are skills in uh, graphic design, because a lot of what we do is communicating risk and how that risk is, is communicated can be done very badly or very well. And that means it, like choosing the right medium, uh, putting it out to the right sort of um, to the right age groups or the right platforms. There's a whole range of things around that. But then the other thing as a, as a social scientist is you have to interpret data. And if you've got my PhD thesis had 144,000 words I transcribed for that. And I then had to analyze those. And for that, you have to come up with your own sort of form of coding for things as well, which actually really are quite embedded in those skills that Sean was just talking about as well, but applied in a different way. So I think it's just important to kind of uh, sort of look at it from that perspective as well. Yeah, we, I would add to that too and just echo those thoughts. Um, I think more than ever now, computer skills are, uh, are, are a bigger asset than they ever have been. Um, another good idea would be look at, look at uh, job announcements and see what, what's required. And you know, very often see uh, specific computer skills, looks like C, you know, knowing the C language and ver various things like that. But one thing I wanted to add to be aware of, um, you may find if you if you do go that path and get a job starting computer programming for uh, for for modeling or data analysis, that um, that's pretty ninety percent of what you'll be doing. And I know a lot of people, particularly in mo computer modeling now, so it's taken up a wider space, I think, of the science than it did many, many years ago, and um, that may be bad, <laughs> it may be good, but that's something to consider. Do I want to be doing 90% of my time, you know, computers, or am I really interested in, you know, observing the sky, <laughs> um, so, or collecting data? So that's just something to be, be aware of, I would say, cognizant of, because I do know people that have got burned out doing computer, you know, they find their computer, pro they're working on code all the time, and that could be classified as um, as computer science or com uh, engineering, you know, code engineering, whatever, not atmospheric science. So just some something to be aware of. And some of the others may not agree with me on that, but it's my personal view. Um, so yeah, I will say computer science skills will help you quite a bit. Um, actually, this most of this week, uh, work on my PhD project. I have not been looking at my cool model runs. Um, I've been fighting with code and doing a lot of code debugging. Um, but I did want to point out that it's great if you have a computer science background. That'll be super helpful. Um, but also for those of you who don't have it, that's okay. I didn't come into grad school with a really strong coding background. I honestly tried to avoid it. Um, and over time, just working on my project and having to make plots and now working with model data, um, I can now code in two different languages. So you can also learn on the job and um, figure it out while you're working on it. So it's awesome to have a background in computer science, um, but it's also OK. and You can still be successful if coding isn't your favorite thing. Kenzie, did you have anything to add? All right. Um, 
our next question. Uh, what are the requirements needed for an entry level position at NSSL? Um, I'll go ahead and say that this is going to vary a lot per position. We NSSL hires all sorts of people from meteorologists, computer scientists, to physicists, engineers. Um, so it's going to vary based on that, but I will turn it over to our panelists and see if they have anything on from their specific things that they work on, what sort of would be the entry level things that they'd be looking for in their niches within NSSL. A lot of so, thinking. Which is I'll, I'll just come on and say that um, we hire a lot of people through the Cooperative Institute, CERO um, at OU, and generally people have a master's degree um, or a PhD, although there are sometimes jobs that come up for folks with a bachelor's degree too. Um, but like Vanna said, the type of degree can vary pretty widely, and particularly in the social and behavioral sciences, we hire everyone with degrees from meteorology, geography, economics, political science, psychology. I, I could go on. I could go on a lot. So um, even just in the small subfield of social science in the weather, there can be a lot of variation in the type of degree. Yeah. I like Kenzie said, it, it varies a lot between different positions. I mean, like I, I work in the part of the building here and, and the part of NSSL where we actually design and build a lot of the equipment that we use for field work. And we just recently hired somebody um, that had a background in electrical engineering and working on radars in the military. And that was sort of the skill set that, that we were looking for. You know, we need somebody that can work more with your hands and, and designing things and building things. Whereas another group that's working with radar data, for example, has a completely different skill set that they may need. Uh, there's a wide range of positions. It, it honestly just kind of varies depending on what group's looking for help on any given project at a time and how long that project's going to be there and, you know, to what degree that person is, is going to be working with things. And that sort of determines what the requirements of that are. So, you know, at, at any point in, in your stage of your career, whether you have a little bit of experience or a lot of experience or one degree or a few degrees or whatever, um, you know, there's there's always going to be opportunities that might be there. So the only thing I could suggest would maybe be to, to watch job postings in both NSSL and CERO and the university side of things. I mean, there's there's a lot of opportunities that just kind of show up from time to time. So just watch out for those. Yeah, and those job descriptions are really clear about what you need. So that's the other thing as well. So if you if, even if you're not interested in that particular job, if you're interested in that area, you can see what level that they're, that they're hiring at. Um, I, I'm, I'm a research scientist, and so I think the minimum for that is probably a PhD for a research scientist. Uh, but if you're a, you know, a postdoctoral fellow, again, you probably need a PhD. But, you know, in our group, we've worked with master's students and undergraduate students. And we welcome that because it gives a diverse set of views, a diverse set of experiences. And I think that that's what makes us stronger as a lab as well is to take on these new things. And what we have then is a really nice mix of this institutional knowledge of people that have been here a very long time and people learning new things or applying new things. So one of the things that we've been working with is people who are communication specialists. And when we say communications, that not, that's not just about pictures, but it's about how we phrase things and the words we use and also the languages we use as well. So one of the things that we've, we've also been looking at more, uh, more recently is, you know, employing people who are multilingual uh, and can help, uh, help understand uh, these, uh, the different cultures and the different needs of different communities. So I think that's really important as well. So there is the academic side. But there's also these other transferable skills and knowledge that are super important and make us a really diverse lab. So I might add something to my previous statement because Justin said something that made me think of this. Um, there's a there's a saying here, and I'm probably going to mess it up, but I've I've heard it before. It's something along the lines of like dress for the position you want or something, which is always a weird saying. I never really understood it. But um, one thing that you can do if if working at Ciro or working at the School of Meteorology or working here at NSSL is something that you're interested in, and you have kind of an idea, let's say that there's there's an area that you're really focused on and you really want to work in there. Look for those job opportunities because it'll help you decide 
um, you know, hey, these are the qualifications that they're looking for, but also look at the people that are in those roles. And, and this is something that I did when I was going through school. I identified pretty early on, I think it was about halfway through my undergraduate career, hey, I know exactly what I want to do and I know the person that I want to work with and the division that I want to work in. So I kind of modeled the skill sets that I developed over time to work towards that position. And that can help in a lot of cases because it, it kind of builds you towards that. Now, uh, that may change, you know, over time. And that's okay if that changes. Like, don't don't feel like you have to be stuck in a rut. Like, I set down this path five years ago and now I'm, you know, I just have to do it. Like, a lot of times people will, you know, completely change their directions on things. But uh, if that is something that you're interested in, like I said, look at the skill set of the people that are in those positions now and, you know, maybe work towards that if, if that's what your ultimate goal is. I was going to mention something very specific. If you're not familiar with something called USA Jobs, it's a federal um, system, web system, where all the federal jobs are, are posted on there. I don't believe they're posted on the NSO website for, these are federal jobs now, uh, but if you become familiar with it, it may be difficult to navigate, but if you become, become familiar with it, you can begin to go in and see what are the requirements for different positions like physical scientists, one, for example, that's used very commonly. Um, and then the announcements will specifically say which labs they're at, and it's still maybe one. Um, so this is something you could do on your own to begin, become familiar with that if you're interested in a, in a federal job eventually. All right, thank you all. Uh, next question, uh, also preparing for going into meteorology and thinking about things in school. Is there a specific minor that you would suggest for a meteorology major? Or minors? Okay, Go ahead, I, say, I, I was most recent doing this, uh, still in school, uh, so I'll chime in. Um, so definitely uh, math. I actually do have a math minor, um, and because a, a lot of the meteorology work is based in calculus and stuff like that. So having that background will make it a lot easier um, in dynamics courses and thermodynamics uh, in order to understand um, a lot of the math going on behind the scenes. Um, and then also I would say uh, computer science, that's a minor I attempted to do and then dropped it. Um, but had I continued with it, that would have been very useful. I, I, I'm wondering here as well. So, you know, you've got your pure meteorology units that you'll obviously have to understand. Uh, but if you are interested in things like societal impacts, I would say understanding psychology, social sciences, political science, uh, geography, all of those things are also very, very useful because they all come into play when you're talking about risk, vulnerability, communication of risk and helping the, 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 the public be better prepared for severe weather events. So all of those things from my perspective, I would say, but as the outsider is here, as the English person here, I don't know the pure ins and outs of the college system. So, I think I'll just add that I, the minor that you choose might be really, again, sort of dependent upon which direction you want to go. Um, so if you want to go into more of the engineering side versus the computer science side versus the social science side, et cetera. Um, but I will say that if don't let the minor be at the detriment of other activities, you know, like don't don't get yourself a minor, but then you're not able to participate in this club or this other activity that you really want to do. Because I think those activities and those experiences are really also important to be on your resume. Um, so like anything, it's a really hard choice. You got to give and take because you can't do everything. But a minor is definitely a good option if it's um, especially related to the subfield that you're particularly interested in. I would uh, add one other sub thing, minor point, uh, physics. <laughs> I've known several people that started in physics, atmospheric science, because physics really is the basis of anything pretty lightning studies, for example, is one, one example. So I thought I'd 
mention that as well. I wouldn't necessarily advise doing that. <laughs> I know for me, it'd be too much, but for some people, if you had, you know, the interest, you could do it. As a lightning person on on the call, I will say that I almost got my minor in physics, and then I ended up doing math because it was a lot of extra courses. Whereas you're going to have to take the math courses anyway. Anything else on on minor suggestions from our panelists? All right, hearing none. Uh, general reminder: feel free to. Put some more questions in the, the questions pane on the GoTo control panel. Also, feel free to send send emails, questions either during or afterwards to uh, the outreach email, which is nssl.outreach at noaa.gov. Um, always happy to answer questions anytime outside of this as well. Uh, so our next question up is, what can I do to increase my likelihood of being picked up for uh, being picked up as an undergrad researcher as a freshman? I'm not sure I understand that question. Can someone give me context? I think I think this person is wanting to apply for um, a research assistantship. Um, as a as a freshman, sort of maybe I assume out of you, maybe not, but in general, how would you encourage someone to increase their likelihood of, of being picked up for one of those positions? So uh, I I maybe have some experience. It's kind of close to this. I wasn't a freshman. I was a sophomore, um, but I actually got started uh, working here at the lab, like I mentioned earlier, with the Hauling Scholarship. But when I went to talk to my eventual advisors for the Holling Scholarship, I said, hey, you know, here are my interests. Here's kind of what I wanted to do, which the thought I had in my head at the time, I thought was a great thought. And it was completely physically impossible. Uh, and they told me that. So that was a good learning experience for me. But uh, they actually offered me a job at, at the time because they were in need of a research like assistant as an undergrad to process uh, our mobile or not our mobile, but our lightning mapping array data, which at the time was a very intensive processing job. And it took a lot and they had somebody that had just graduated out. So I essentially just kind of fell into the job, which worked out very well. So there are positions like that that exist in different parts of the lab and within CERO, within uh, the School of Meteorology, within other organizations like the Oklahoma Mesonet, for example, has a number of student positions of working with and processing a lot of the data. So those positions are out there. It just kind of depends on what your interests are and just be you know, aware of what the different positions might be and be on the lookout for them. Uh, sometimes, you know, when people have a need like that, that they, they need filled, they'll announce it where like they'll send out an email to basically everybody in the school. It's like, hey, you know, we've got this job. Here's what it pays. Here's what it does. Is anybody interested? And then you can just apply. Uh, I know we do that with large scale field projects when we run them out of here, when we need a lot of students involved. Uh, and the number of students changes depending on the project. But a lot of times we'll send out like calls to say, hey, like we need people to come study stratiform electrification in a ballooning project that we're going to do so you know we need a bunch of people to help and and just being aware of those types of things and watching your email and don't just you know auto delete all those emails that come into your inbox all the time which i'm definitely guilty of uh try to pay attention to those and and see if there are opportunities that are out there i think it's no harm in also approaching uh like professors or you know research scientists and, and asking you know i've I've had uh, people wanting to do postdoctoral uh, fellowships and wanted me to be a mentor and they just reach out with an email at first and I say, oh, that's very interesting. And then we set up a meeting and then you go from there. So sometimes you, you can sort of chance your arm a little bit and find out if there is something. And what you don't know maybe is that they've already been thinking about something for a while and you just come along a little bit like Sean did just at the right time. And, you know, you, you, there, there's a little bit of that as well. Um, if you're polite, if you're if you're honest about what you want to do and, and honest about your skill sets and things like that, there's, you know, there's always a conversation to be had. And I've never turned anyone away from those conversations. Um, and if I don't know something, I will pass it on to someone who does as well. And I think that's what we all do here.
Any other words of advice before we move on? All right, so our next question up, we're gonna move a little bit away from the career advice topic. Uh, what's the most interesting project you're working on? Go ahead, Justin, since you seem ready, go for it. There's, there's two that, that here. So one was kind of hinted at in the in my introduction there. So I've been working on a project uh, which was sort of called Tornado Touchdown, which is a means for people to um, report when a tornado touched down near them and to report what they did, whether they sought shelter, whether the shelter was available for them, uh, what they may have done in a watch phase, what they may have done in a warning phase, because we've never collected that data on mass before. And uh, we're doing it in two kind of ways. Uh, one is uh, letting it go out with national weather forecast uh, um, meteorologists who go out and do damage assessment uh, and they can take that survey with them or have the digital version. And secondly, it will be uh, open for just all members of the public who have experienced that. They'll just be able to log on. Now, I say it's the most exciting thing it has been. It's had to go through very, very um, serious kind of uh, OMB pro projects, which is the Office of Management and Budget in Washington. It's taken a year to get those permissions right, to make sure our tech's working. We should be launching hopefully in uh, spring of next year or just before spring of next year. So look out for it. This has been my thing for a long period of time and it's been very frustrating because not everything goes in a straight line. And I think that's really important to get across as a scientist. You are going to hit walls. You are going to hit barriers. You're going to have days that are just ah. And I think it's really important to kind of know how to negotiate those with a good deal of emotional intelligence, but also have that sort of, I call it gentle tenacity, but it just means I gently nag people, um, but in a really polite British way. Um, and so that comes across, it kind of works. Um, so that's quite a useful uh, skill set to have as well. And um, yeah, so that's one thing. And the other thing that we've been doing is taking um, the Vortex Southeast, which is now becoming Vortex USA um, work and bringing it back to the public and actually asking for their input about what we found and also saying this is what we found. So one of the things we've been working on is to do with, and I'm grabbing something, is nocturnal tornadoes. So I'm going to hold this up. So the little graphic, this is a fridge magnet that we developed and it says, as you can see, tornadoes can and do happen at night, but it's got a bit of magic in it. So I don't know if you remember as a kid, it changes. And it shows all the ways that you can get the right weather information. So this is part of a project that we've been doing. We've been working with Sea Grant down in Mississippi and Alabama initially, but moving this across the country where we're going and finding out what people feel they can and can't do in terms of sheltering, what they feel they can and can't do if they live in a mobile manufactured home. All of these things are really important for us to know and to try and improve the outcomes for when severe weather occurs. So uh, you can tell I came alive then. So I'm definitely really, <laughs> really excited by these projects um, and uh, these are the sort of things that keep me really engaged in the work that I do here. I hope that's okay. Thank you Justin. I'm gonna just call on someone now. Rachel, I'm gonna call on you next. What's your favorite thing you're working on or most interesting? <laughs> Most interesting. I don't know if anything I'm currently working on is the most. Can I talk about the most interesting thing I have worked on during my PhD? Would that be allowed? <laughs> sure, go for it. Okay, so besides the modeling stuff I've been doing day in and day out for the past year or so, um, the coolest thing I got to do was help out on a tornado project called Taurus back in 2019. Um, and so that was really fun. I was part of a crew that would... Uh, drive a truck full of a bunch of these like little you know those really small coffee cups that are made of styrofoam uh so we would have those but they had instruments inside of them and we would attach them to kind of normal size balloons and we would um throw them towards uh supercells um and we had to be <laughs> say it's really just you know you just kind of throw it um gently and um, so that that was really cool. Um, that was really fun. It's it's outside of what I normally study. I normally study um, nocturnal thunderstorms. Um, so that was a fun chance to sort of get outside of what I usually study and get to be a part of a tornado project. Awesome. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, Bob, do you want to talk about your most interesting project? Uh, yeah, well, what I'm doing right now is pretty exciting uh, using one minute 
GOES imager data. So GOES is the geostationary satellites. And for the first time in ever, we have one minute images. Every minute we have another image in different spectral bands. And we're using those to track cloud movements at the top of thunderstorms, also hurricanes, to estimate the winds in a very high uh, resolution, uh, minute by minute. And in terms of the tropical storms, those winds are now going into uh, to models experimentally uh, used at the National Hurricane Center uh, to, to improve the, the track forecasting of hurricanes. In terms of thunderstorms, we've noticed that uh, we sometimes see a, a very extreme high wind outflow above above a thunderstorm where the updraft emanates, and um, that could be another piece of information uh, useful for um, hail formation and perhaps tornado genesis as well. It's still in its infancy, so that, that's something. Um, cutting edge work we're doing. I did want to want to share something uh, uh, going back to one of the most exciting things I did uh, when I the first day I stepped into NSSL as I actually was an intern. Someone said, "Do you want to go up to Oklahoma City with us on the KT, KTVY antenna?" And I said, "Sure." So NSSL used to have instruments on the tallest television station in Oklahoma City which has changed, actually it was WKY back then, it's changed its name. And they use that to measure uh, gust fronts, the the uh, vertical cross section of gust fronts. And that's an elevator that goes up 1200 feet or so. <laughs> and so that was a pretty exciting kickoff to my first visit to NSSL. Thank you, Dr. Sheldon. Thank you, Bob. Um, Sean, I'm going to call on you now because I know you want to go grab a thing. Yeah, so I did want to take the opportunity. The project that Rachel was talking about uh, was kind of a, an initial go at this. A normal radio sawn looks like this. This is the device that we normally attach to the bottom of weather balloons. It measures things like temperature, pressure, wind speed, wind direction, relative humidity. And the Weather Service, NOAA's National Weather Service, actually launches these about twice a day across the country, and this provides us vertical information about what the atmosphere looks like. The problem is that these take a while to go up all the way. Um, you can only launch a few of them occasionally. It's a reasonably sized balloon. So the wind sun system, which is the one that Rachel was talking about, looks like this. They're much smaller, uh, much, much lighter. Uh, this weighs just a few ounces, basically. And you can use what is the equivalent of a party balloon to actually launch that. So it allows you to do much more like rapid fire uh, soundings or you know profiles basically at the low levels part which gives us a very different look as to what's going on uh, within severe weather or you know whatever it is that we're trying to do and I think uh, my most interesting thing that I work on is all of it uh, I know that's probably cheating but with the job that I have in the area that I work in like what's the most interesting to me is being able to do all of these different projects to have a researcher that comes down that says hey like I've got this device that fits in a coffee cup made out of styrofoam and I want to throw this into supercells how do I do that so I have to design a truck or a vehicle or a platform that allows them to be able to do that and the truck that they used uh, we actually built in about 24 hours because the day that the project started the original truck we were going to use had a problem so we had to get a rental vehicle and then rebuild the whole truck in that so there's a lot of like last minute things that happen uh, which is always really exciting um, we really push the envelopes with a lot of the stuff that we work on my dissertation work was actually on a device called a video sonde which is about six pounds of styrofoam tape and glue that holds a camera in it and we actually launched this into thunderstorms to look at microphysics you know raindrops snowflakes hailstones things like that you know frozen grasshoppers whatever happens to be up there and it's that kind of challenging and, and pushing the limits of the environment is what I enjoy so much about this. And that's why it's it's the most fun to me is, you know, we constantly get to do projects like this that nobody's ever done before, which is really nice. Thank you, Sean. Kenzie, how about you? Uh, so I think, I mean, like Sean, Pretty much everything I do is really interesting, but one of the things that hasn't been mentioned yet um, is work in the hazardous weather testbed. And so what I get to do a lot of the time is 
um, talk to forecasters while they're creating forecasts of new products or new tools. Um, and then sometimes I get to go and take those new tools and walk across the hall over to a room full of emergency managers and say, hey, here's this brand new thing that the forecasters created. What do you guys think? Like, is this useful? Is this something um, that you think is valuable? Because realistically, I don't want forecasters creating something that no one's going to use and I also want to make sure that the people who are using it understand what it means and find it useful. Um, so the hazardous weather test bed is one thing that I really enjoy every spring when we get to bring all these people together during real severe weather events and see how new products, technologies, um, what's the other word I'm looking for, systems and processes work. Thank you, everyone. Fun things. I love, they're all exciting. It's all exciting. I love it so much. Um, our next question up, um, what do you think is the biggest question in your area of expertise that will be answered in the next 10 to 20 years? I realize this is a tough question. So whoever feels ready to answer first, just please go ahead. So I, mean, I, I can admit that and we can go with should be answered instead of will yeah. be answered. <laughs> That's what I was going to say is I, I don't I don't know that this will be answered in the next 10 years or so. But I think one thing that's really interesting in my specific field of work um, is this idea of user centered research design um, or basically what it means is that we go to the users and we go to the people who we ultimately want to impact, whether that be members of the public or emergency managers or broadcast meteorologists or National Weather Service forecasters, the list goes on and on, but we go to those people and we really start with them. Like, what are the big problems that you are facing? What are the challenges that you want researchers to help you try and remedy? Um, and we bring those users in right from the beginning and then we keep in touch with them throughout the entire process. So as a researcher, I can once again, kind of like what I said earlier, just make sure that uh, the work I'm doing has impact on people and it's, positive impact and then hopefully with the systems we have in place we can track how new technologies um, new processes are influencing those users um, the, the, the something else I think what we study are complex problems and there's huge amounts of complexity and so there's not always a oh that's the answer you've got it boom it's done there's there's lots of things um working with it you know whether in society in the way that we do you know we're talking human beings that's always going to be messy people have different opinions different views different uh, ways of accessing the science different ways of understanding the science different levels of education all of these things impact how people may perceive a danger or perceive a risk and so we need to find that out by not assuming that we know because we're scientists, but actually, as Kenzie says, going to the, the, the public and actually saying, well, what do you think? What's what? You know, when it really comes down to it and push comes to shove and you know you're in a sort of a, an insecure structure, what do you do? What choices do you do? How do you communicate that? Do you communicate with others? Uh, do uh, local faith groups and organizations help you out? Do they help you, you know, by providing shelter? So just in that very tiny tiny thing around sheltering that i just mentioned how much complexity is there so what we do i think really is um we chip away little by little as we, we try and find out you know and try and get that perfect sculpture at the end you know of, of what we really want to know i don't think we can find it out in one go um and kenzie i mean like you're talking some fantastic things there are new products i know that some of those products take 10 years or so to develop and to bring into the public domain. And that takes, again, a great deal of patience, uh, understanding, creativity. And I think that these are all, again, coming back to, you know, things that are strong suits of personality of what we encourage people here at the, at the lab to have. I've only been here two years, but, you know, I'm always amazed when I have conversations with people about how much they know about things and I learn from them. So I think that's part of it as well. Can I can I add to that? Um, yeah, I, I like those answers, and I yeah, I don't think well anything's going to be solved in ten or twenty years, but I can I can look back at 
the evolution so far in in the field. And uh, as you saw in that uh, video, John Lewis was giving the history of NSSL starting in 63. Well, in 65, there was a series of devastating tornadoes in the U.S. And just afterwards, there was a, that was an impetus to begin the work on Doppler radar. There was no Doppler radar before that. Uh, it took uh, literally 30 years, 20 or 30 years, to, to, to fine tune it to a point where it was nationalized and in a state that it could really provide better warnings. Uh, we're still not there yet in terms of perfect warnings, and I don't think, I don't know if we ever will be, but I see this, this incremental, um, as you said, Justin, chip, chipping away at the problem. And I'm guessing in 10 or 20 years, the warnings will be more, more precise, tornado warnings specifically, uh, where they'll be really like really sub-county <laughs> and minutes perhaps. Uh, there's a project that's been going on for a few years now called Warn on Forecast at NSSL um, that's trying to do that in, with, with numerical weather prediction using input from radars and satellites and such to begin to really pinpoint like 10 or 15 minutes from now, how is that storm going to evolve? Um, progress has been slow, but um, you know, it's, it's chipping away. I think breakthroughs, big breakthroughs, we have no idea what's gonna happen. And there could be a break, big breakthrough in anything that will change the world, <laughs> but we can't predict it and we shouldn't be able to predict it. <laughs> Otherwise it would have been done before, right? <laughs> So that's just my my two cents on it. Um, so I guess I'll go. So my main area of research is in what a lot of people call squall lines. Um, we usually refer to them by a much fancier acronym of QLCS, uh, which is quasi-linear convective system. Um, it's, it's a bunch of thunderstorms in a line quasi-linear, we just complicate the name a bit. Um, <laughs> but uh, so a lot of the focus in research in tornadoes and winds has been focused more on supercells, which affect, um, you know, states like Oklahoma and Kansas. Uh, it can also affect the Southeast as well. Um, but looking at supercells where it's just one storm producing, you know, a lot of those severe elements. Um, but so now I've noticed there's been a recent um, turn in looking more into these QLCSs or these squall lines, because um, they can also produce tornadoes, they can produce severe winds, um, but those mechanisms of how that occurs isn't as well studied as in supercells. Um, so I think there's gonna be a lot of research in the next decade or so to figure out how, if it's a different mechanism compared to supercells in forming tornadoes um, in these QLCSs and what kind of processes go into forming uh, pockets of severe winds um, in that, um, which is kind of relevant because I think it was a couple of nights ago here in Oklahoma. Um, we actually, myself, my husband, and our pets were sheltering in our interior bathroom um, because there was a QLCS coming through and a small tornado formed about three miles east of our house. So, and so we really need to, um, I, I think that's a, a area of study that will be looked into a lot more in the next decade um, so we can get better at understanding them which will also help better forecast them because it's really hard for forecasters um, to know which little uh, wave in this QLCS is going to wrap up and form a tornado. I guess I'll go since I'm the last one. Uh, I, I will add to what Rachel said because a lot of the work that I do uh, kind of is in the same realm of things and the severe weather aspect of things. And I, I do want to point out, I think it's important to realize a lot of these research projects, I mean, we have large scale research projects that are designed around one or two basic questions about how something works. And a lot of times we go in and we end up asking 30 more questions because we we realize that, you know, the com the the complex problem that Justin mentioned earlier is way more complex than we, we even thought it was beforehand. And, you know, yeah, we might not find the answer to that initial question that we were after, but 30 years ago, we ran the original Vortex project, which was designed around studying tornadic supercells and why some storms produce tornadoes and some don't. 
or why that storm produces a mile wide tornado and the one right next to it's 50 yards wide and is only on the ground for 10 seconds. And that's a question that we're still trying to answer. That's what the project, you know, Taurus is that we're doing right now. But even though we didn't answer that original question back in the Vortex One project, if you look a few years down the road, I mean, that doubled the warning lead time for tornado warnings. And I mean, Vortex Two helped that as well. So, I mean, we do see improvements as we gain that knowledge and we understand more about the environment that you know that we're that we're looking at it does help even if it doesn't ultimately answer the question so to speak because there is so many things that are going on uh, a lot of the work that i do at least on my dissertation work is more on that microphysics side when i'm not like designing and building all the research equipment that we use and looking at like where these different types of raindrops and ice particles and things feeds in uh, extremely importantly to a lot of the, the convection. I know Rachel's been doing a lot of modeling work with a lot of her research and just changing kind of those those microphysics parameters can make a very big difference in the evolution of things. So understanding how those play out and, and what the right profiles are in the right situations and how it's changing. I think that's something that we can probably start to answer in the next five to 10 years. Is that going to solve the problem? No, probably not. <laughs> Uh, if, it, if it did, you know, like like Bob said, you know, the answer would be easy and we've done it 20 years ago and we'd all be done by now. But um, I think, you know, as we as we chip away at it, as we get more of those pieces, it helps us identify the new questions that we need to ask and where to take our research going forward. I wanted to add right. something that wasn't mentioned yeah. in my mind was uh, phased ray radar. So that's the next maybe leap in radar technology. Um, that will really speed up the, uh, the the frequency of the observations of these storms dramatically. Um, that one would would hope would would at least help the detection problem, if nothing else, uh, immensely. Uh, and it may be it may be 20 years or 30 years before um, before there before those we radars. We have a local are emergency now. alert, so if anyone on the call can go ahead and mute that, thank you. Okay, <laughs> I was just saying it, it might be 20 or 30 years before that's fully implemented, but it's it's on its way, I think. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for dealing with the uh, emergency alert test. Uh, <laughs> Good timing. I, I will just go ahead and add to that. I think a lot of people were hinting at it. Technology has been improving, whether that's computations or instrumentation, and our knowledge improves with it. And as it goes, like we'll get better observations and can do more things with it. And always more things to learn. Um, anyway, after that very tough question, I'm going to throw a couple of fun questions your way so we can get to know our panelists a little bit more on a personal level. If you did not choose to pursue meteorology as a career, what other career would you have chosen? Go for it, Justin. So this isn't, I'm, I'm gonna flip this on its head a little bit because I've probably had a few careers before I came here and also I'm not a meteorologist. So that's, there's a whole mess of stuff there. So um, one of the things I did in the in, in the in the 90s, I was in a, in a quite a well-known indie band, indie rock band, and I kind of did that for a year, year or two. And yeah, I was the lead singer. So although I'm quiet and stuff like that, I, I put it out on stage a bit like doing this sort of thing is putting my different personality out. So I, I did that and I, I did find it really, really um, interesting, and really useful. And I learned a lot of things and I traveled a lot with it, which was good fun as well. So, you know, I did that. I was a web designer. I was a teacher for 12 years before I stopped being a teacher. Well, yeah. Um, and I did that while I was putting myself through my PhD, um, which was kind of tough. And at one point I had to go, right, I just have to stop teaching now and focus on the PhD. So I've done many things. And I think that that's what's really great. Not everyone just does one thing ever and only one thing ever. Um, I don't know what my next a job would be necessarily and whether that would stay within the realm of meteorology or whether it would then branch out and further into disaster risk reduction as well because I'm still interested in all those things as well all these things are passions that, that drive me and so I think that's what it is I think I'm a passionate person who's very interested in the world which is why I became a geographer and that stayed with me my whole life even when I was 
<laughs> oh, so, so shamed but even when i was like singing on stage and stuff like that and yeah very odd but there you go so I've silenced everyone now. Wow. <laughs> I um at the time I don't know what I, I I don't know which path I would have taken if I didn't go the path I did, but a few years later I did have a second thoughts about well, I think it's time to kind of change gears here. I've been working in this for area now for 10 or 20 years, kind of a little bit maybe like Justin did, but I did consider becoming a physical therapist. Um just because I knew people that were physical therapists and a yoga teacher. But the the my friends that are physical therapists said, you know, it's really no fun. You're just filling out papers more than you're actually working on people. So <laughs> I kind of quenched that interest right away. <laughs> but I think teaching is something interesting. I never really liked the idea of thinking I would teach and I'm not, I don't consider myself a teacher, but now in the later years of or being in the field so long, I have found these opportunities to um, to teach uh, in tribal colleges. I'm wearing a shirt from the one in uh, Utkavik, Alaska, formerly known as Barrow, Alaska. There's a NOAA observatory there, by the way, long-term long-term observatory that measures CO2, et cetera. Um, and so that that's opened up a lot of new interests and in worlds, learning different languages and learning the um, the um, um, weather skills of weather forecasting that are have been inherently learned down through generations by by observing the sky and being in one place. So I just thought I'd mention that. Um, yeah, I think anyone as they go along are going to find different interests. But it's difficult to find the, right, the, the path in the beginning. Choose well, should I go to the left on the fork or the right? <laughs> Flip a coin and sometimes. <laughs> so I kind of thought about this a little bit um, not too long ago, and I really love what I do. Um, and meteorology has brought me to a different place than I really thought it would. If I had to go back and I was forced to choose something else, I think I might choose something like engineering, which really isn't that far off <laughs> from meteorology. But I'm very detail oriented and I really like building things. So I think I'd be good at it and also enjoy that. Uh, as a side gig that I do now, I'm actually a figure skating coach. And so that is just something that is really different from what I do and it gives me some nice balance. Um, I get to teach in, you know, I get, I actually get to teach little ones who can barely walk and then we put skates on them and put them on the ice and get all kinds of interesting experiences there. But I really enjoy that as well. Um, I guess I'll go way out there. Um, I have thought about this as a joke, like, you know, really frustrating days, like, oh, if I wasn't doing meteorology, what would I want to do? Um, <laughs> and uh, one of the things, I um, think I would probably like to be a fitness instructor. I like to work out. Um, I work out like five, six days a week. Um, and something I really enjoy doing. Um, I've like I've had friends come with me before and have fun like, oh, let's do leg day today. Let me teach you how to do these things. Um, so it's kind of nice to have, you know, the whole science -y side, like sitting down working at desk. But I also really like to be active and move around. Um, and that's something I really enjoy doing. So. I think back in middle school, this is going to date me a little bit, but there was a movie that came out called Brink. If anybody online remembers that, uh, it was about a group of high school kids that got really into skateboarding. And there, I spent about six months of my life convinced that I was going to become like the next Tony Hawk. And that was that was my goal for like six months. Uh, thankfully for everybody involved, that did not come to pass. Um, if I wasn't in meteorology and I had to do something else, I actually think I might have gone into... Uh, lighting design for like stage type productions. I actually worked as the lighting manager for our auditorium in my high school, uh, basically all of my high school years, and actually really enjoyed like working with the lights and designing the different set lighting for different, you know, scenes and moods and things like that. It's it's a very completely different path, uh, but I, I had a lot of enjoyment doing it. So I might have uh, ended up there, which would be a lot more traveling for productions than I probably do right now. 
Fantastic. Thank you, everyone. Uh, I do want to let everyone know we have only 20 minutes left in the panel right now. Uh, we're going to try to get through the questions. If we don't get to your question, do email the NSSL outreach email. It's nssl.outreach at noaa.gov. And we'll try to make sure that it gets to the right people and they can get you the answers that you didn't get to hear on the panel live. Um, our next question, also fun. Uh, what do you do for fun outside of work? I'll go first, <laughs> just to get it out of the way. Uh, I actually do a lot of home renovation stuff. I just recently, uh, my wife and I both completed the renovation on our master bedroom, doing a lot of re-drywalling and hanging fake wood all over the place and, and things like that. Um, when I'm not completely tearing apart a house, uh, I spend a lot of time video gaming, actually. Um, a lot of people probably are like, oh, video games. But like to me, it's it's a stress relief for me. Um, so I do a lot of online gaming on my Xbox and, and things like that. And my, uh, my daughter, my 15-year-old daughter is really into Minecraft. So I play a lot of Minecraft with her when she's down and, you know, designing things on there. So it's a, it's a nice hobby to have on the side. Uh, I'll go next. Um, so as I said before, I really, really like working out. Um, I also love hiking. Uh, in fact, uh, my husband and I went on a trip last month and we went out to Taos, New Mexico. And that was like the main thing we wanted to do is we wanted to go on a bunch of really cool hikes and then eat delicious New Mexican food afterwards. Um, so that was fun. Um, we also have three pets, uh, two dogs and a cat. Um, so I spend a lot of time with them uh, when I'm not doing meteorology. Um, and if you couldn't tell by my background, I have what some would consider to be too many plants. Um, so I really enjoy um, taking care of my plants and repotting them and shopping for new plants and you know, convincing myself I don't need a new plant um, and that sort of stuff. Okay. I guess Justin's pointing to me. <laughs> so similar to Rachel, yeah, exercise of being out, outdoors and doing physical stuff has been a big part of my life all along. I've never needed a car to go to work. I've used it occasionally, but or school for that matter. So I bike mostly for commuting. Uh, basketball, been playing basketball pretty much to the pandemic started. Now I'm swimming quite a bit cross-country skiing, especially when I lived up north, and yoga. I do quite a bit of yoga, you know, every day as well. Um, just about anything outside that requires some physical movement is good for me. Um, also, um, taking some classes uh, at this college in the Arctic Coast I mentioned, uh, which are more cultural classes. So learning the Inupiaq language, um, I did a native plant class last year where we made our medicinal salves from uh, uh, stinkweed and things like that. <laughs> Doing a sewing class right now, and I by no means are, am a, a sewer, but I made some mucklucks and things like that. Just trying to kind of branch out and do different things. Okay, so... Um... A couple of things. One, Rachel, uh, have you got any cuttings? Because I really want plants. One for the office, because I don't know if you look around here, but um, you know anyone who knows that the, the walls are a little bit grey, and so a bit of green would be nice in in my office. But also, I want to grow some plants uh, on my balcony. Um, back home in England, uh, we have something called allotments, and allotments for around about fifty dollars a year. Uh, gives you a bit of land and you go there and it's a, a bit of land where loads of other people have a little bit of land and you grow all of your own vegetables so well, not all of them but we used to grow our own potatoes that would last for about six months a year our own onions garlic um, purple sprouting broccoli and that I just absolutely love that and it's something I really miss so um, it's something I'd like to be doing here in Norman if there was some sort of uh, you know opportunity for doing that as something I want to learn but I think the other thing that's been throughout my entire life has been a love of music um, I love listening to music I love going to concerts. I, obviously, during the pandemic, this has been a lot harder. Um, and going back to what Sean uh, was talking about, um, I love computer gaming, but I also like computer gaming soundtracks. And so a lot of the vinyl records I collect are soundtracks from film, TV, 
but also um, computer gaming as well. So I've got some very strange ones there, uh, but also some nature programs from a, a guy called Sven Leibach, a, a Danish composer who did Australian nature TV programs. It's a little bit weird sounding, but it's amazing music. So I did that, and one of my favourite things to do is, and is to go down um, onto East Main and go to the record store there. And when I say records, I mean vinyl records. So just because you know, I did say to someone records, and they thought I collected paper receipts, and I was like, no, 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 that is not what I collect. I collect vinyl records. It's a bit of a different thing. So yeah, and I've, I've just literally bought last night the uh, soundtrack by Hans Zimmer for um, Interstellar, which is just so beautiful. Yeah, so I'm, I mentioned earlier that I'm a figure skating coach, so I, I've been skating forever. Um, and so being able to keep up with that and to give that back to the skating community has been really re rewarding for me. Um, like Rachel, we have uh, pets. We have two feline fur children named Diego and Mowgli um, that my husband and I are probably too obsessed with, but that's all right. Um, and we also really enjoy gardening, like Justin said. So we have a backyard garden that my husband's really into it, and somehow or another, it gets bigger and bigger every year, which I'm not sad about because that just means less lawn to mow. But <laughs> we're really into growing everything from tomatoes and asparagus uh, to flowers and things like that, too. Thank you, everyone. Uh, reminder for anyone who submitted a question, we're down to 15 minutes. If you don't get to, get to it, please do follow up with the outreach email, which is in the chat at ssl.outreach at noaa.gov. Um, our next question up is, what are some of the things that you do to inspire future generations of meteorologists, atmospheric scientists, or related fields? So I said I used to be a teacher and of course during the pandemic teaching changed quite a lot and you know at one point there wasn't in-person classes and things like that and that was a global phenomenon. So one of the things that uh, we did here at um, uh, Ciro, um, which is formerly Sims, was um, they asked if people wanted to put some lessons together. So one of the things I did, I put a, a lesson together on snow, hail and grockle and um, kind of produced some information on it, but I also produced uh, lessons so that they could do so people could follow along and parents could follow along with their children things like that. and I think they, these sorts of things are super super important because you can engage people in the fun of learning the fun of science the creativity that there is in science as well because I was I'm thinking about that when Sean was talking about the lighting I was thinking that actually all of us here really have, have mentioned that we're very creative people in lots of different ways and I think sometimes there's this sort of attitude that scientists are oh, not creative it's just about the numbers and, and actually, you need to be able to do creative things with those numbers and and uh, infer or try and analyze them. And that takes a huge amount of creativity. So I think that encouraging that in uh, the youth from all ages is really, really important. And if you've got really good fun activities that are, you know, action oriented, as well as like listening to like information, that's always good fun. So I'll just chime in and say that I do a number of different things. This is something I'm really passionate about is showing people that um, scientists are humans. And, you know, just because you don't maybe look like all the scientists out there doesn't mean that you can't be a scientist. And so one of a couple of the things that I really like to do um, locally with the University of Oklahoma is I really like to work with undergraduates, whether that be a capstone class or a new mentoring program that I recently joined. And um, I get to share a little bit about my experience, but also learn about their own experiences and how your experience really shapes the kind of scientist that you become. Another program that I'm really excited about is called Letters to a Pre-Scientist. Um, we call them pre-scientists because you just don't know that you're a scientist yet or you don't know if that's what you want to be. And so I get to write to my pre-scientist um, who's a fourth grader in California and we just get to be pen, pal pen pals back and forth talking about uh, the things we're interested in and uh, different parts of our lives. And then another really cool program that I haven't participated in, but a bunch of my friends have, is called Skype a Scientist. And that one's really easy, especially during the pandemic, because it's what we're doing here. You get to uh, Skype with a scientist. And I know a bunch of friends who have done that and got to talk to a whole classroom of students and just describe the things that they've been doing. So there's a lot of opportunities out there. And I think it's really cool to be able to take advantage of them. 
just want to quickly follow up on that. And I did something in London a few years back, and I don't know if it came out to the States and it was called a pint of science. And so the idea is that the three scientists would get together or they'd be there on a panel in a pub or a bar and actually people come along, have a drink and learn about our science. And again, it's that informal communication, you know, that helps people understand what we do and demystifies it as well. Because I think that's really important, like you just said there. Um, and yeah, it's, although it's important to do it with with uh, kids and the youth, it's quite nice to do that with adults too, actually. And I think having a pint afterwards, this really makes a difference. <laughs> I was going to mention a few things I've been involved with kind of along similar lines, um, but with mostly younger students. So I kind of got this relationship uh, started with uh, a school out in Navajo Reservation, um, middle school and elementary school. And so they have a STEAM class. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but where they combine, the, it's like a STEM class, but there's art in there as well, which is very important in that culture. So I uh, usually go out there once a year and uh, and then we have a lot of hands-on activities because these kids have not really maybe, they're out there, but they haven't really maybe connected with the natural interest they might have in the sky and weather. So one thing we did was, they did was to build box kites and use that as learning experience for the wind. And of course it's fun and it's artistic. <laughs> And then up in Alaska, uh, affiliated with the college up there, uh, from time to time, they've had um, a summer camp on climate change, right on the, the school classrooms, right on the Arctic Ocean. And um, those are middle school kids and high school kids as well. So we have a Davis weather station, put it out there. The kids actually put it together, things like that. So the hands-on activities, I think, are really important, especially at those, those ages. Um, to, to um, connect with maybe a natural interest that wouldn't they wouldn't have really connected to before. Um, I guess I'll go. Um, so one of the things um, that I like to do, I've gone with OU um, and we go to our annual conference that's called AMS or the American Meteorological Society meeting. Um, and a lot of times what I like to do is I like to work at the booth for OU. And a lot of times you just get a lot of undergraduate students that are interested in grad school, um, potentially as OU for grad school. Um, so I really like to talk to people, give them an idea of what grad school is like and answer a lot of questions um, that they may have because um, you can find some stuff online about grad school and you can talk to professors um, but I found that this undergrads really like talking to an actual grad student and getting their perspective um, so that's one thing that I like to do. Did you have anything to add Sean? Not really. Uh, I think they pretty much covered everything. But I mean, it's it's events like these, you know, it's it's outreach panels, it's talking to different conferences or, or going to cultural fairs or job fairs or things like that. And uh, a lot of times, you know, we'll go out and the way I kind of approach things is if I can talk to 30 kids and one kid finds an interest in it, it was absolutely worth it. Um, you know, just just being human and, and talking to people about what it is that we do and what their interests are at any at any age range at all um, is really, really rewarding. So I, I really enjoy doing programs like Skype a scientists or writing letters to pre-scientists or talking on like the Noah Live panel that I've done a couple of times. And, and one of those calls ended up uh, I had a, a professor at in the UK that reached out to me and to give a similar talk in the UK to an entire school district out there. So, you know, little activities like that can make a huge difference and convince people that like, hey, like this is something that I enjoy and this is something that I can do. And like, that's the goal is to give everybody that knowledge and that power that like, hey, if I want to do this, I can do this. I just need to, you know, go with it. And that's a really good feeling to be able to, to give that to other people. Thanks, everyone. Uh, we are getting close to our wrap-up time. This might be our final question. Hopefully not, but just in case, if it is and we didn't get to your question, I'm so sorry. Please send an email to the outreach email. It's been in the chat a few times, nssl.outreach at noaa.gov, and we can answer it via email later. So please do send in your questions if we don't get to it here. 
Uh, our next question is, did you ever have a fear of storms? And do you have advice for anyone who does? I go, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> I was going to say, I used to not have a fear of storms. I grew up in Maryland, so we really only had kind of lame thunderstorms. Um, we were too far inland, so any hurricanes that came by, we just got some gentle rain. Um, so I didn't really know what I was getting into moving out to Oklahoma, but I never really feared it. Um, in fact, I found it exciting. Um, more recently, I, becoming a homeowner has changed my perspective though. Um, so this year we had really large hail um, at our house, which was, you know, we hadn't even been living in it a year and we already had to replace the roof and had busted out windows. So I wouldn't say I fear storms now, but I do have a lot of anxiety when they're going to come hit my house. Um, so that's been an interesting perspective flip from renting and being like, oh, the landlord will cover it to now like, oh crap, now I got to file an insurance claim. Um, but I guess for like dealing with the anxiety, just staying like weather aware and trying to keep things in perspective, like, you know, we know we have our interior bathroom to go to if we need to shelter. We have friends in the neighborhood and we know um, they have a storm shelter. Um, getting my cat in the carrier if we know there's going to be severe weather so that I can move him around if need be, because um, I don't really want to be digging for him under the couch um, if this are, there's a tornado coming. Um, so those are little things I do to prepare for storms and deal with the anxiety around them. I, uh, I would say I don't think I have a fear of any sort of severe weather. I've been involved in a lot of research, research projects over the years hail, lightning, tornadoes, hurricanes, flash floods. Uh, I do have a very healthy respect for all of that and understanding kind of the hazards and what goes into it and the situations that it can create, I think helps drive away some of that fear. Uh, I know a lot of people that have struggled with fear of, of severe thunderstorms, for example, and then they start studying meteorology and they learn more about it and it kind of takes that fear away because you kind of understand it more. So, you know, if, if it is something that you're worried about, you know, like Rachel said, definitely like pay attention to warnings and, you know, educate yourself on how to react to situations like that that you see, but also just learn more about it so that it's not this unknown, because a lot of times I think that's what's scaring people is you fear not knowing what's going to happen. You fear not having control. Uh, I, I definitely feel a lot better and a lot more comfortable with things when I'm paying more attention and I know what's going on and I feel like I have more control over the situation than if I'm caught off guard like I was the other night when the uh, tornado warning came through at one o'clock in the morning and I woke up and looked at my phone and was like, well, I'm glad I'm not in that warning because I wasn't paying attention. Um, so, you know, it's just kind of being aware of, of those types of things. I think that can help a lot in those, in those sort of situations. And um, I agree. And as the foreigner who's like really foreign, as in <laughs> coming from the other side of the world where tornadoes are not such a a, a big thing. Um, I, I, <laughs> when I was back in, in because of the pandemic, I, I was back in London for a sort of 18 months and a tornado did occur in Barking, which is about uh, 10 miles away from us. But it was oh it may have may have made an ef0 on on, on the on enhanced vegeta scale and i say may and that's being extremely generous um i also happen to know that at 1980 81 there was over there was a tornado outbreak of over 100 tornadoes occurred and like i said that's really skewed the data making it things like britain is like the tornado capital of the world it's not at all and so coming out here it's has it's been an eye-opener and one of the things that i've um, enjoyed is learning from all these people that study all these things and they are teaching me the signs and teaching me what to look out for and you know i know what to look out for on radar now and things like that i didn't know these things before i came and that actually gives me a bit of comfort as well. So um, unlike Sean, I was awake. I was like, I got up and I said to my wife, I'm just going to get up. I'm not trusting this. And I can see what was coming in. And I was like, mm. and I was sat there and then the siren went off and I was literally, and we'd already prepared the bathroom and the interior. We're on the third floor of the apartment, but we prepared it all beforehand. And we practiced with the kids beforehand as well. I think that's a really important thing. It's not just about how you're feeling, but thinking about how people that might be in your care and, and people have mentioned pets as well, how they how they might be, be, be feeling about that severe weather as well. So I think that's um, it's have a healthy respect rather than a fear, if possible.
Yeah, I was going to just agree with Rachel that I think um, owning a home here has made me a little bit more fearful of the impacts of the storms, not necessarily the storms themselves. Um, but one thing I just wanted to emphasize from both Justin and Rachel was that find if you are nervous about storms, or find those things that you can do beforehand. Um, you can do like hours beforehand, maybe when the watch is issued, you can make sure your things are prepared so that if a warning is issued, you're ready to go. And there was one time I was caught off guard and I was way more anxious about that one because I hadn't prepared everything in advance and the cat ran under the couch, right? So there's some things that you know you got to do. Doing them beforehand before things get dicey is really helpful. Any final thoughts, Bob? <laughs> One minute. <laughs> no, I, I agree. I mean, I'm still afraid of afraid of storms in that sense too. But having the knowledge, like uh, Sean was pointing out, is really valuable. I, I was really aware of the situation because I was following it. My wife said, "Should I get dressed and go in the storm shelter?" And I said, "There's nothing to worry about. You know, it's just if it is, it's going to be like." two minutes of high winds and, you know, it wasn't like an F5 tornado situation, but I think generally people may not understand that. And and my impression is that the hype on on the media, the, the media presentations over alarm people, they don't really maybe understand the nuances between us. Oh my, oh my goodness, you know, tornado, and they kind of treat it all the same. So I think that's just an example of the knowledge, you know, having some knowledge can go a long way to uh, easing at least when you really should be, you know, concerned and maybe, you know, well, the probability is less than something else happening. Fantastic. Thank you, everyone, for sharing your thoughts and experiences. Thank you to all of our panelists. You've been fantastic. Um, thank you to everyone who's attended. I am so sorry if we didn't get to your question. Please do submit it via email. We will answer via email. Um, they will forward it on to whoever needs to be involved in that answer. So we will we will answer your questions one way or another, but please do email us so that we can email you back. Um, thank you again very much. I think it's been a great, great panel, uh, great panelists, and appreciated having you all. <laughs>